Hi, uh, this might be a relatively short session. Um, we'll see if anybody um, uh, hangs around or shows up, uh, needs any help with assignment two or anything. So uh, I had one or two things that I might uh, just go back over again. So we, we, we covered um, assignment two uh, in detail on the last help session. So if, if uh, you haven't watched that and you had some questions, you've been working on assignment two, you might want to go back um, to the previous help session um, on from Tuesday and, and look at that. Um, so let me just remind you about a couple of things. So assignment two is due by Friday. Um, I've started to look at the um, um, submissions. I'll try to look at them some more here today, uh, give some preliminary feedback, okay? so. If, um, uh, I mean, you should chat, you should be using GitHub uh, as well to communicate with me, with me. So, you know, you can send me emails, but you can also use the, the GitHub pull request to leave comments and things. So I've been uh, interacting with a lot of students who have been figuring that out um, um, uh, through GitHub um, in various ways. So, um, so last time I already, Accepted the assignment too, so I won't show that again. Um, I will kind of maybe remind, you know, so if you log into GitHub, uh, if you need to get back to your repository for the assignments on GitHub, um, I showed this last time, so you won't find them if you like uh, pull down your repositories because this repository is actually created as um, it's actually owned by my organization. You're just given access to it, you know, permissions um, so that you can write to it um, and, and read from it, right? So, of course, you can create your own repositories on GitHub. Hopefully, hopefully people will learn how to use GitHub, this tool, and, and start doing that. But if you want to see the repositories for the assignments, you have to go into the correct organization, our fall 2021 class, uh, and get into it that way, all right? Um, I don't think I've started up my dev box, so I'm going to change into my directory. So again, you'll probably be repos directory if you follow my instructions. I'm in um, boxes here. I'm going to get my Vagrant up to start up my um, development environment. Uh, you know, try and always check that everything looks good when you're rebooting up your um, virtual machine, you know, so make certain that your port 8080 is being forwarded. Um, make certain that your shared folders are mounted um, and that the guest editions seem to be okay. Uh, usually the shared folders won't mount correctly if you don't have your guest edition set up. So. And if we've got that, you should be able to go to the 127.0.0.1 on 80 or 8080 um, and get access to your code server. So, um, all right. So if you've already cloned a repository, but you shut down your Visual Studio code, um, you know, you don't want to clone it again. Uh, so hopefully everybody's figured that out. You want to just open that folder back up. Right, so um, let me open up the folder. You know, another thing you'll have to learn how to kind of um, navigate on the, uh, the the file system here, right? So depending on where it, it might open you up in a different place, so you need to use the, the two dots to go back up one level. You know, and if you go back too far, um, our home directory is home vagrant uh, on here. So you're we're actually using a username called vagrant um, in these dev boxes um, but yeah, anyway so if you do if you follow my recommendations you should have put cloned all your repositories to the sync assignments directory so here's my assignment two which is the folder i want to open back up again so. all um, so, um never showed kind of configuring your environment um, 
I kind of nowadays I, I I've kind of become partial to dark themes. I guess they're somewhat popular, and I, um, I'm finding that I like them visually, you know, make it easier on me to read them. So um, you can easily pull up a, a theme by you know hitting the gear to get up your settings and command palette and everything. Um, but yeah. So you can go directly to the color themes if you want to Let's pick the dark. Another thing is, um, I don't know, you may, you may or may not find this right map. I mean, to me, this doesn't really help me navigate at all. Um, so I usually just remove that. Um, so that's a quick settings. So if you go to your settings and search for like, um, like mini map, I think you should find it. So, um, and, and you can um, disable that to, to disable the main map if you don't like that. In general, you know, I mean, there's lots and lots of settings. So, um, so you might have to guess on it, um, like, like just search and see if you can find the thing you're looking for or Google, right? So if you have something that, that you want to try to fix or configure, you might have to Google on the VS Code um, to find the setting maybe. Well, I'll get rid of that, I think. Um, I, I think I've shown this before. I, I kind of like the outline. Um, um, so by default, you might have had your outline kind of at the bottom. You might not see how to use it. There's also like a timeline um, as well. All right. So I, I often like that. Uh, later on, when we get into our assignments, we'll have more than two or three functions. So it becomes useful then, instead of scrolling around, searching around to be able to, to see and go exactly to, you know, I need to go to my constructor for my class, or I need to go to the is empty function or, or what, whichever function. And I think I've already shown, you know, I mean, this is a, um, the editing area is, is a pained area, you know, so you can, um, configure things around the way that you need them. So you can have one pane. Um, they can set them up to be top and bottom. I don't know why my system is being so slow here today, but you can set them up to be top and bottom. Here. Um, or, or side to side. So I usually like my stuff to be kind of side to side. Um, all right. So last time, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to repeat the stuff that I talked about on Tuesday. Um, I got you started on the assignment two. Um, maybe I'll mention a few, th a few other things. So I forgot to, uh, or I only showed creating issue one and, 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 and creating uh, that issue. So I usually do prefer to do these one by one so that, uh, you know, if I've completed task one, that's when I'll go um, create my task two issue um, and then associate it with the pull requests. So, um, So there, now we've got task two associated with um, our pull request here. So, um, another thing about the pull requests. So, oh, um, like it says here, um, I should have emphasized this more on like the practice assignment. Um, I'm sure I mentioned it on the video for the practice assignment. Um, but, but yeah, you don't, don't close or merge this pull request. So this is the main way that I interact um, and check your um, work for the assignments here. So you should always leave this open. And in fact, when I'm evaluating your assignment, um, I will close that. So if I think that it's 100% complete and I don't have any other things that you need to do to, to complete the assignment, I will close the um, the pull request uh, for you. 
So that's kind of your um, that's that's an indication to you that that you know you're 100 done on an assignment. And if the pull request is still open, then um, um, there might be you know I, I might be still waiting um, on work, or I might have given you some additional tasks to fix. So for assignment one, if you missed a requirement or something like that. Um, um, I might have added uh, another issue that you had to fix that, that I wanted you to kind of fix before I fully accepted the assignment one. Um, another thing, I had a question. Um, if if I do pull, if I do close the pull request. Um, but you want to go back and see the, uh, the the feedback that I gave, so the evaluation things. You, you can always get to the closed pull request. So if you go over here to your pull request, and by default it'll show the open ones. But if if this was closed, you could click on the um, the closed one and, and get back to the pull request, even if I've already closed it, right? So so you might want to do that. Um, so so if I do close the pull request, um, I, I will still you know. It means that I accepted it, but I might have had some feedback. So in particular, I'll also I'll off, uh, often do code reviews as well, right? So um, if I look at um, your code, um, and um, you know uh, I, I can make comments on some code reviews. I'm um, going to open up. Uh, let's open up my practice assignment zero zero to, to kind of give you an example of what I'm talking about here. So what I'll often do is, uh, so I mainly use the, the features of GitHub to look over your code uh, when I'm evaluating things. So I, you know, I can quickly look at just the differences between things that you did. Uh, and if I want to, um, so I'll often give code reviews but which is basically just comments, uh, but comments pegged to specific locations of the code that you've changed. So, you know, I might uh, put in um, a code review comment um, and say something like, um, you know, um, you need to add space here to conform to class style guidelines. Or whatever, right? Um, and I can add multiple review comments. So, yeah. So, so I often do that when I'm making kind of a final evaluation of your assignment. Um, and the way that that will show up is if you go back to your pull request, it'll kind of look like uh, comments um, uh, that came from me instead of like you know, a student. But but then you'll be able to see those. Um, and you can go specifically um, back into the code and uh, look at it in context here. Right? Um, by the way, for this, this normally shows only the, the diffs. But, so the diff between your current a set of commits in this pull request. Um, so things you've added is in green, things you've removed is in red. Right? If you need more context, you can always um, expand out the blue part to see the the parts of the files that haven't been changed yet. So, so this is actually the full primes.hpp header file. So none of this has been changed. The only thing that's been changed so far is to add this line, so add the um, prototype for the is prime function here. Okay. Um, So, so last time we did talk about all the tasks here. Um, I was a little bit short um, 
you know, I was hoping some people might um, uh, come up and ha- show up and have some questions here. So I didn't, um, I, I talked about all these, but I kind of went through quickly the, the last two. So the last two will probably take you the most uh, effort to do. The operator union and the operator intersect. Um, um, I give a description of the algorithm um, that, that is probably the easiest to implement for both of these. Right? Um, oh, and also, by the way, that's part of the thing that'll be on the ish, issues as well. Let me go ahead and um, add the task five issue and the task six issue as well here, or create it. So for um, task five is to, uh, to implement the union operation. So set union, right? So set union is um, if I have two sets A and B, um, the union is conceptually it's a new set that contains all the items that are in A or B. So so if it's an A or B or both, then it should be in the new set again. Okay? So the way that we're actually doing the operator union is as a member function, and uh, we don't create a new set. So um, uh, we need to talk about dynamic memory allocation in order to give you the mechanisms to actually to create a new instance of a set class to return as a result, right? So all we do um, for this assignment is we modify one of the two sets to, to become the union, right? Um, So union is pretty easy. All you have to do is iterate over all the items in the other set that's given as input. Okay, so for operating union and for operator intersect, both of these take a parameter um, and they take as input um, another set, right? And that's perfectly valid because remember we're adding set is, uh, when you create a class um, in an object oriented language like C++, it's like adding a new data type to the language. So by creating our set class, we can create variables of type set in order to create a new instance of type set. And, and we can pass those sets in as parameters to functions. And we can even pass them in as parameters to member functions of the set class itself, which is what we're doing here, right? So the operator union and the operator interset take another set as input um, and as I describe here, uh, you should pass in that other set as a constant reference parameter. All right. So just as a bonus for this video, I'll give a little bit of an example of, of the um, of the signature for the operator union, just to make it clear. So let's open up the header file. So, um, so for like operator union, uh, both of these functions uh, don't return any result. So the, the, the result happens because it, it modifies the, the set that we call the operator On, right. So neither of these are constant functions because, you know, when we call operator union on a set, it's going to be modifying the set, the set of items on that um, set that we call it on. Right. And uh, both of these, um, you need to pass in the other set um, as constant reference parameters. Okay. That's a requirement. So what that looks like is something like this, All right? So the constant means that um, the parameter that we're passing in, uh, we're guaranteeing that we won't modify that parameter, you know? So, so um, as, as a result of calling operating union, we don't change the other set, 
it will be exactly the same after we return from calling operator union and operator intersect. Right? So that's what's constant. So, so that uh, we ran, a, we talked about that constant parameters um, in the, the first week. Um, so when we pass an array, and actually in your first assignment, um, it was required that you pass in for some of the functions that you created, that you passed in the, the array as a constant parameter. So the same kind of thing here. So we're guaranteeing that we're not modifying the other set by declaring it to be a constant parameter. Uh, but we're passing in by reference. This is more of a performance thing. So if you didn't pass it in by reference, it would be passed in by value. And like we talked about, like we reviewed last week, uh, when you pass things in by value, it actually makes a copy of it. Uh, and that could be expensive here. I mean, we could have a set, although, you know, we kind of have a limit of only having 100 items in our set, but if we didn't have that limit, you know, percent, potentially our sets could have thousands or tens of thousands of items or something like that. Um, and, and that could be potentially expensive um, to pass it in by value, to make a copy of the set. So, so if, we, if we pass it in by reference, um, you know, we're not, we don't have to make any copy. So to use or to implement um, my operator union, um, all you have to do really is iterate over all of the items in the other set that's passed in. So, so you're gonna be iterating over the items in this other set. And then every item that's in the other set, you're gonna add that item to this set, right? So you wanna call the add item member function to add all the items that you find in the other set into this set, right? Uh, and, you know, recall that, um, um, so you're required to reuse add item and add item is supposed to be implemented already at this point from the, the task three or, or task two um, in the assignment. Um, that if you add an item that exists already, uh, it just silently ignores a request to add a duplicate item in order to ma maintain the sentence, right? Um, so there's no problem that uh, if you just add all the items in the other set, you know, if it's already in the set, it's, uh, you want it to be in the resulting set. So that's fine. Um, but if it's not in this set, um, then the add item should add it from, from the other item, from the other set. Um, into this. So the result of doing that then will be you'll get the union between the other set and this set. Um, and and the, the results of that union will be put into this set, all right? And then I already showed you the operator intersects uh, uh, member function signature. So it has the same signature, it doesn't return a result. Um, and it should pass in the other set as a constant reference parameter, right? Um, so operator intersect, so, so the intersection of sets, the, the mathematical concept is um, the intersection is just the items that are in both of the sets. So it has to be in this set and the other set to be in the resulting intersection, right? So conceptually, what I'm suggesting that you do for the solution is that, uh, again, you iterate over the items in, in the sets, but you're going to be removing the items from this set that are not in the other sets, all right? So basically, if you look at each item in this set, and if you find, if you check if it's contained in the other set, and if it's not contained in the other set, then you need to remove it by calling remove item from this set. So, so hopefully that makes sense, right? So um, if you remove all items that are not in the other set, you know, so if you, if you look at all items in this set, you check if it's in the other set. And if it's not in the other set, you, you remove it from this set. If you do that for all the items, you'll end up just with the intersection of, you know, the items that are in the intersection of this set and the other set. Um, but you have to be careful iterating over these items. Um, 
So I suggest that you iterate over the items in reverse order because remove item, if you implemented remove item correctly, it works by, by you know, whatever item needs to be removed, it shifts all the items that were higher um, in the items array down by one position to fill in that hole for the item that's removed. So if you iterate forward, uh, you'll have problems, right? So if, if you start by checking the last item in this set to see if it needs to be removed or not, and if it does need to be removed, then um, um, there's nothing above the last item that needs to be shifted, right? Um, so you're safe to then uh, check the next item uh, lower, right? So, so anyway, if you go backwards um, to the, the, the array of items that you're checking and removing them, you, don't, you can then safely reuse the remove item function to remove the items um, from the array, right? So anyway, that's the operator union and the operator intersect, right? So I think, um, I mean, depending on how comfortable you are with doing array operations, but because you're you're reusing functions here, um, so but but yeah, I mean, these will these will probably take you the most time, especially the operator intersect um, to iterate backwards through the um, array of items, right? So. Um, and, and I guess remove item uh, might be tricky for some people as well, because here you have to first search for the item to be removed. And then once you find that location, you have to shift all the, the items in the items array down by one position. Right? Being careful not to go past the end of the array and doing other common problems with um, accessing uh, arrays in C and C++. All right, um, so like I said, uh, I think that'll be all for this video that I had to specifically talk about. So I'm gonna um, stop the recording here and I'll post this. Um, I'll, I'll stick around in this help session here, see if anybody um, has questions uh, about the assignment too. Um, but otherwise I will uh, see you guys uh, later. So keep working on the assignment too and get it in by Friday here.